the projected Insoc and its rivals emerged as fully worked out political theories. In the past, no government had the power to keep its citizens under constant surveillance. The intervention of print, however, made it easier to manipulate public opinion. And the film and the radio carried the process further. With the development of television and the technical advances which made it possible to receive and transmit simultaneously on the same instrument, private life came to an end. Every citizen, or at least every citizen important enough to be worth watching, could be kept for 24 hours a day under the eyes of the police and in the soul of official propaganda. With all other channels of communication closed, the possibility of enforcing not only complete obedience to the will of the state, but complete uniformity of opinion on all subjects now existed for the first time. We have seen in our lifetime the use of technology. We see the use of the bracelet used for prisoners who can be let out to work, but followed with every motion under constant surveillance. The real question I'm posing is the notion of technology, how it fits in a democracy, and how it fits in higher education, and how do we harness it so that the tail does not wag the dog. The final notion is that of higher education in a democracy, having what may be the summary of all of the things I've mentioned, and that is the responsibility to influence social policy formulation. Social policy formulation is interactive. Policy for education interacts with policy for health, defense, security, and economics. Higher education in its teaching role must provide firmly, broadly based foundations of learning to provide adequate high quality thinking and use of intellectual tools to posit and debate the assumptions and to reformat policies. It must produce in its research role well-educated thinking researchers it must produce in its faculty minds those values of social policy research questions that are basic and can be used. It must pose some political solutions and directions. In its public service role, it must provide leadership through individual institutions, collaborative endeavors, call policy conferences independent of policy-making bodies and in conjunction with these bodies, and critical to the process it must involve people on the line and provide good leadership. As the federal government, through its redistribution of tax dollars, heavily influences the outcomes of higher education and democracy, immediate attention must be paid to the system's currently at work to develop policy parameters for the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act of 1965. The reauthorization of this act will set the policy framework for social policy for higher education for the next 12 to 15 years. Here, the policy assumptions must take into account the affirmation of diversity. Shall we continue to have public and private higher education? Is there a clear need to delineate nonprofit higher education from profit higher education? Whose responsibility is it to fund profit making higher education? Should the policy for support be based upon students and a market mechanism? or institutional aid, or both? Is there really a way to create equity and cost between public and private institutions and subsidize both equally? Affirmation of diversity in ethnic makeup, affirmation of diversity in higher education, affirmation of diversity in the, in the society, and certainly the larger implications of policy for higher education in its promotion of its social justice role is to examine the assumptions and documentation. In short, higher education must be an active participant in the development of social policy and must of necessity sometimes take the lead even when it must be out in front and viewed to be ahead of its time. Higher education to be real in democracy cannot simply reflect the society. It must have an active assertive role rather than a passive responsive role. It must create pre-collegiate co uh, partnerships. It must structure and help to restructure the quality and productivity of lower education. Our country as a democracy must have a comprehensive educational policy, which we do not now have. Our democracy within the next two years must seek such policies for it is long overdue. 
Many nations throughout the world, democracies, totalitarian governmental structures, dictatorships, benevolent dictatorships, socialistic countries, etc., all have comprehensive policies about education. Last summer, I had the opportunity to visit in Singapore and be exposed to the National Policy for Education and see the results of having such a policy, results that have driven education forward already to the 21st century, to create students who's, who, who's product, as products of its institutions who will be the competitors with American students and indeed will be competitors with the American democracy. A policy for education will clearly define the supports and parameters for how we maintain and nourish our democracy. A policy for allocation of resources. A major role and responsibility for higher education will be to influence that policy. In short, our society must support and enable higher education to function and it must enable higher education to perform the needed societal functions subscribed to it, such as policy development. There must be the healthy symbiotic relationship between society as a whole and higher education. In summary, I have said, drawing upon my own thoughts and explorations, thoughts of others and exploration and dialogue about higher education and democracy, the following. That it is the guardian of democracy, at once participating in it and shaping it, nurturing, celebrating it, and all the time attempting to secure and upgrade it. That higher education carries a very special task to educate for democracy. That it is a guardian of the responsibility of developing the capacity to acquire knowledge and skills and to help our young people master the pervasive tendency toward conflict in our species. That it has a requirement to intervene in the legacies and change the direction of intergenerational transfer of discrimination. That it has as a major responsibility to support democracy in America. It is all there, knowledge and understanding, social policy, intergenerational transmission, guardian of democracy, all based on citizen participation, for it is here that the battle for the future of democracy will be won or lost. Shall we have a democracy or shall we have a question mark? Higher education must be there to help solve our problems. People who cannot communicate are powerless. People who know nothing of their past are culturally impoverished. People who cannot see beyond the confines of their own lives are ill-equipped to face the future. It is through higher education that this nation has chosen to pursue enlightened ends for all of its people. And this is where we in higher education must nourish democracy and the future battle will be won for democracy. I thank you. I would be glad to dialogue or take any questions. Yes? I thought it was interesting, uh, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the Oakville uh, Convention that America was involved in volunteerism. And then you rather eloquently uh, made a case for kind of a larger role in the university, and then uh, talking about citizens participation and so forth. I wonder how you feel about recent suggestions that public service should be introduced as a dimension in the higher education. There's an organization called Compact, which is maybe a major theme of one of the lawyers. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I would. I happen to be supportive of that, I would say. Um, it seems to me that, especially for our younger people in the high schools and elementary schools and into college, that the notion of being participants in is extremely important. If we really observe what we have produced over the last two decades, we've produced some bystanders and observers and no participants. And I think as faculty members, those of you in the audience, you must see that in your classes, that students are passive observers. You can only gather, I believe, 
the kind of participation by being an active participant. I think also the notion of removing from our young people, even in poor families, responsibility to contribute toward has made it a weaker democracy for us. I happen to believe that public service and service should emanate and be a part of a structure that helps young people and older people too who missed it develop the sense of participation and responsibility for it. Yes. I think it can be utilized to meet those goals, and I also set forth the notion that I happen to believe that public universities and private colleges and universities probably ought to have a closer relationship in terms of support, because that's where you get the linkage between private industry and the public institutions. I think that the, if we can have some agreed upon goals and priorities, the question becomes how do we fund them? And that's the question we have been unwilling to really deal with. Uh, does it take place in a public institution or a private one? Is there a way to keep the downside of the private relationship that is being charged for buying universities, et cetera, if this is what you're suggesting or asking the question of? I think that there is a linkage that needs to be forged between the whole notion of higher education, whether it's in public or private, and how do we then fund it, the cost-price question is really one that allows private enterprise to intervene into providing the funding for and sometimes the controls for what goes on in the institution. Yes. Yes, I, she's, her question is to comment on the role of women's colleges. I come fresh from a meeting of women college presidents about three nights ago, and then in December, the, um, another meeting. I think we now have about 92 women's colleges left in the country, and the notion of the resurgence of their role as institutions that are deliberately focusing attention on the development of professionals, uh, informed citizens, and focusing on the development of a new generation of parents who are able to transmit is extremely important. The whole notion of role in peer development, I think, is something that's coming out of women's colleges. So we see collectively a role that is still available, and most of the colleges are still residential, and gives the opportunity to impact upon the full development of the young person, to give her the opportunity for practice of democratic values, for example, and leadership roles which often is not true in the wider university setting in the same kind of way. Uh, about black women, I think that the two black women's colleges that exist, Spelman and Bennett, serve a very important role because they too pull out women to give them the opportunity to move ahead and develop in a structured way. I think more importantly than just educating women is a wider responsibility, and that is to influence social policy. I think that women's colleges have the real role in a beginning to influence social policy that affects women and children especially, and to be advocates or actively involved in an assertive way in shaping what that policy should be, intervening in the questions that directly affect women. One of the things that our college that I find fascinating, we are engaged in having done a review of the mission of the college and deciding that it should remain a women's college and that because it is a women's college, it ought to be different and our faculty is engaging in the dialogue between the biology department and the other faculty in the curriculum committee about the notion of a course on women's health. We raised the question if it's a women's college, should not every woman who leaves here leave fully aware of the whole notion of the spectrum of things related to women and their health as well as other things. So I think we're beginning to look at, in an assertive manner, what are the things that make us different? and to be involved in that in producing the next generation of professionals and parents. Yes? Well, for faculty, I see the role of maybe three parts. One, 
really teaching well. I think opening up the curriculum and investing in real teaching time. Present company accepted, the faculty members who may be in the audience with what I'm about to say. The question of the decline of the quality of undergraduate instruction does seem to be related to poor instruction and lack of intervention and interaction with faculty at the level at which it is needed. So I would say one is really good teaching and also a part of that is using the technology. The faculty generally, as it's called to be graying in American higher education, has been reluctant to really learn and catch on to the technology and therefore use it. This is a technological generation. They've been exposed to it since the nursery in the hospital. And they respond to it. And so though I know the purists in the academy say, well, we can't come down to that level and do two, two minute bites, and I'm not suggesting that. But the use of the technology to create the learning environment, I think, is very important. And that means faculty will have to be redeveloped to do that. I think the second thing that faculty can do is honestly engage in not only the maintenance and development of their own discipline area for the curriculum, but look at the wider curriculum and what it means for the instruction of the entire student body. And to be forcibly and actively and assertively involved in setting a very strong liberal arts base and having the development of things that I talk about for the common core of values. I mean, those values, if we can agree upon them, we seem to think we know what they are anyway. But the agreement on them means that they must be nourished, and so they cannot be nourished in the abstract. So I think faculty have that responsibility to look at curriculum and to make sure that the curriculum is representative and also is interactive with the real development of students. And I think third, the faculty, through their own influence, internally and externally to the campus, should use their intellectual knowledge and so forth to influence social policy and to help students learn to influence social policy. I think students should be actively involved in what I say to my students in their own learning. That this whole notion of being the passive bystander will not do. That they must be actively involved in shaping and that they cannot even depend on the faculty just to do it. That students have that as a first obligation, the pursuit of knowledge. And that that pursuit of knowledge must, will take them in several directions once they really intervene in it. I say to our students that they must say to the faculty, pull me, pull me as far as you can go. That obviously is not my own phrase. I got it from Harlan Cleveland in the knowledge executive. But the whole notion of the push me and pull you theory between faculty and students. So I think students must be involved in their learning. I think students must also be engaged in exploration of the common values and practice them. That there should be opportunities for them to practice them and to butt up against them and to fall back from them and to engage in dialogue. One of the things that statistical research shows about the current undergrad, typical undergraduate cohort of students coming into colleges in the last I'd say eight years, is that they have had very little interaction with adults of inequality. And so therefore, they either move back from them, even in controversy and confrontation, that there's not been the kind of quality interaction that helps a young person develop boundaries and other things with adults. So I think students have to be involved in that and to be involved a lot more in groups and get that experience and to be involved in that notion. And then to learn well. I really think that thinking as an art and honing the mind to really do quality analytical thinking is something that students also must realize that they must engage in. I also say to students that it is not enough to graduate with a degree after four years and have an empty shell. And the cost of it is too high. So the whole notion of being involved in learning and getting it. I think administrators have to set the social tone for what we might have called in the past academic freedom. But I would take it a step further and say the social tone for goading the faculty to be involved and providing the environment for that to happen and the opportunities for it and for students to be involved and not being shy of what might happen in the process. I think there's a role for trustees. You didn't ask about trustees, but let me say what I think their role is, because I think it's this enterprise, if higher education really is to be the kind of assertive thing I'm talking about, and if it really is to help with looking back at lower education, 
forming those partnerships, then it's going to take some governance um, structures and some governance investment in having the improvement of education. So I think the trustees have to be looking always at the wider picture and not end up just in parochial, limited vision, the near look. They have, must have the far vision and be able to open up and to get people to support higher education to enable to do this. That's a small piece. Yes? Do you think that to develop this process of democracy, especially in humanity support, you cannot have 100, 200, 500 students in a class, and then perhaps those kinds of classes are really anti-democratic? Well, I don't think numbers relate to whether it's democratic or not. I think that given, again, the intelligence and capability of the faculty, that there may be different approaches to teaching 500 students. I mean, that maybe there's a way that 500 students may be exposed to the same basic vocabulary and introduction to. But one moves beyond that. You see, we're still bound by our old Carnegie system of higher education and those classes that must go 50 minutes and so forth. So this is what I mean by looking at a whole. There's a way to use technology in humanities class. I mean, not just to send students off in the corner with videos, but to use those and integrate them and teach sections of them, to do kinds of things that get them interacting with it. So I think that, that numbers by themselves don't necessarily create or remove the, the democratic principles of that. You see, the extension of humanities class may well be to take those 500 students and have 100 groups of them doing a certain kind of interaction, a thing that follows up. We, we are big at using graduate students in large universities. We don't have that, group, that uh, privilege in small colleges. But to use them differently as TAs and other kinds of things. But to really create the kind of laboratory and to interact across the institution. So I think that it's a matter of taking the initiative and looking really just starting with a blank sheet necessarily to see in a team manner to say what is it we can do? How do we inculcate these values and how do we provide the opportunities for them? And it may be outside the context of what we currently have structured. Yes. I think differences and similarities. I think a lot of times we get hung up on the question of differences and therefore we get people with their antennae going different ways. I like to say it this way. The two things, gender and race, are biologically inherited. And the other two things that really cannot be changed more than anything else. I mean, we don't have the sophistication yet to do it. One day we might be able to splice genes like that, but we can't now. That is reality. There's no political commentary about it being politically right or wrong. I mean, that's just pure, simple truth and fact. If the academy, it seems to me, is to have any integrity in it, then truth is what we pursue. Am I correct? At least that's what we're supposed to pursue. Most of our slogans have truth and light, etc. So I would see it cast in the notion of what is accurate and true, and how does that then become a part of human history, and how should it be taught, and shouldn't it be taught as truth? Yes. Okay. Yes, in the back. Her question is that to address the economics of the support of historically black colleges, are there ways that the general public can help and should help and assist, and are there ways to support it? I would say yes. The economics of the black institutions, the historically black institutions, of which there are now about 87 four year of our, a large greater, has a system of public and private institutions. And obviously the public institutions come under the heading of support by the state but for many reasons have been underfunded with the same principles in many states. In many states uh, in the south, south, the 17 southern states where most of the schools are founded and are, exist, 
uh, under court desegregation orders and other kinds of legal things to, in fact, try to hit a balance. The major question there has been how do you make up for underfunded education for a long time and come head along into the century immediately? And obviously that can't happen, so that means money must go into trying to make up the deficits. It means disproportionate funding. I think the wider society can certainly contribute to that for the private institutions. There's the United Negro College Fund. There's the development of sending money directly to colleges. There's a whole notion of sending students there, and I, I don't mean to say that here at your own school, but there is the notion of sending students in that direction who, who need to go to those institutions or who might choose to go as a part of the pluralism of higher education. But I think every, they are a viable part of the American system and have been extremely important in shaping the democracy that we have. I think if one looks statistically and economically, there could only be the large African-American middle class or middle income group either because there have been black colleges. If those were pulled out of the scene, if someone went to the simulation model, that would be a very different kind of America. And so I think it is an institution that is a national treasure, I call it, our national resource. Uh, in the private sector, we often say this, and I would use the same kind of um, analogy. As we are debating the whole notion now, whether black or white, about private and public education and cost and price, we said to the congressman earlier this week, suppose we moved all the private institutions and you had to educate everybody and as public institutions. That would really be a major task. So isn't it better to help us look at how do we all exist and have a pluralistic, diverse system. It's the same principle, I would say. Uh, black colleges right now enroll roughly, I think, 15% of all black students and graduate 40% of the baccalaureate degrees. And so for whatever the variables are that are at work, we know that there are a lot of different variables at work on predominantly white campuses where students are. And plus, we know that the large bulge of black students in predominantly white institutions are in the two-year colleges and don't go beyond that, and also an unfortunately disproportionately large number are in those profit-making business ventures called proprietary schools. And so I think the whole notion of the option is there, and it is very much a part of the fabric of the country, and they do need support, and certainly everybody can help. I'd like to thank Dr. Scott for that insightful uh, lecture on democracy and its impact, higher education and its democracy, uh, impact on democracy. I would like to make some announcements that there is a reception following immediately at Carly and Gary Tartikoff's home, and that address is 826 Hodge. Tomorrow, uh, on Monday, we have a keynote speaker, Jim Hightower. He will be speaking in this room at 8 o'clock on education for people. So if you can remember to come back tomorrow for this lecture. Um, I would like to thank each one of you for coming out this evening, and um, we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.